Hi, I'm pro saxophonist Jamie Anderson and you're watching Get Your Sax Together. One question I get asked all the time is, how do I play altissimo notes on saxophone? The fingerings I've been given don't work. So in this week's extra special free online saxophone lesson, you'll learn everything you need to know about playing altissimo notes on any sax, but buckle up because if you're expecting the usual short video about using your front F key and using a faster S stream, you're in for a shock because in this lesson, we're taking a deep dive. So many of the great solos that you can learn to play on this channel have notes that go above the standard F sharp range of the saxophone. If you're a beginner on saxophone or even intermediate and above, this can be a real problem. You see the fingering, you use it, but nothing comes out except a weird low note. Sound familiar? <laughs> if you've had this experience, comment below, or even better, if you've had success after watching this video, comment below as well. I'd love to hear your experiences. The reasons why you're not getting the high notes you want are not straightforward, but rather ambitiously, I'm going to attempt to explain it all in this lesson. I'd love to tell you that getting those screamers on sax is easy, but I'm afraid it's not. I'm not gonna patronize you guys by saying just use this or that fingering, because the secret of altissimo is very little to do with fingerings. We're gonna get right into the physics and the anatomy, but just before I blow your mind, remember to get your free PDF from the link in the description. That's got all the exercises, fingerings, and information you need for this lesson. Plus, if you haven't already, check out my free Saxophone Success Masterclass. This is my gift to you guys, and it's a one hour video lesson for saxophonists of any standard, with loads of in-depth teaching to help you transform your tone, improve your timing, design a structured practice routine, and loads of other pro tips and tricks. The link is in the description, or you can visit www.getyoursaxtogether.com forward slash masterclass. Okay, I'm gonna get my lab coat on and we're gonna delve into the DNA of the saxophone. If you're watching this and you just wanted to know the fingerings for Altissimo, then go to the description and get your free PDF now. The problem is you might not be able to get those fingerings to work. And to understand why, you need to understand a bit about the physics of our beloved instrument. Full disclosure, guys, I don't have a physics degree. I'm a musician. <laughs> I've tried to keep this lesson fairly simple. So if you're a physicist, please don't bust my balls and forgive me for any oversimplifications or generalizations. A saxophone makes noise due to three interacting factors, the actuator, the vibrator, and the resonator. To you and me, the actuator is your breath, the vibrator is the reed, and the resonator is a combination of the conical saxophone tube and your vocal tract. These three things interact with each other in real time. When you expel air from your lungs, it causes a pressure difference at the tip of your mouthpiece. This causes air to rush through the narrow gap between the mouthpiece and the reed, making the reed vibrate. As the reed rapidly flexes up and down in your mouth, it creates pulses of acoustic pressure that travel up and down the instrument bore and your vocal tract, forming standing waves. These acoustic standing waves in turn influence the vibration of the reed. In fact, they dominate the frequency that the reed vibrates at. These resonances are usually determined by what keys you have pressed down, although it's actually the combined resonance of the sax and your vocal tract that determines the standing wave frequencies that control the reed. So breath causes the reed to vibrate, which causes an acoustic standing wave inside your body and your sax, which in turn controls the vibration of the reed. Key point, your body matters. Now here's an important distinction to get your head around. The air in a saxophone moves in two very different ways. First of all, there's the air that's physically moving out of your lungs past the reed and into the mouthpiece. This is air molecules being physically moved from one area to another. You can think of this as DC, direct current, or the water in a large river as it flows from A to B. Most people think this is the only air movement that's happening. But at the same time, the vibration of the reed creates oscillating acoustic air waves that travel up and down the tube of the instrument and down your vocal tract. In these acoustic waves, each individual air molecule oscillates back and forward, but stays in the same average position. You can think of this as AC alternating current. This is analogous to the ripples on the surface of the water if you throw a stone into the river as it flows along. Each water particle only moves up and down in sequence, forming a wave, just like a float bobs up and down on the surface of the ocean, but stays in the same place. Of course, these two types of air movement happen together. 
the air moves from your lungs into the horn at the same time as those air particles oscillate to and fro as standing waves. The DC air movement makes the reed move, and the movement of the reed creates the AC air movement that controls the frequency the reed vibrates at. They both work together. Let's recap. The vibration of the reed is determined by the combined resonances of the saxophone bore and your vocal tract. This is known as the tract reed bore system. Your vocal tract, the reed, and the bore of the saxophone. Tract reed bore. Now here's the important bit for altissimo. For the notes in the normal range of the instrument, the vibrational frequency of the reed is mostly affected by what keys are open, with the resonance in the vocal tract mainly affecting timbre only. In other words, by and large, the keys you press determine which note comes out. I'm sure you're familiar with that concept. <laughs> However, as you get up into the high frequencies of the altissimo register, the air molecules in the sound wave in the saxophone bore can't easily accelerate through the open tone holes, and the open tone holes become more invisible to the acoustic wave. So the standing waves extend beyond open tone holes. In other words, with high frequency notes, the open holes on the instrument don't make as much difference. This is why you can use altissimo fingerings with gaps in them or cross fingerings. This effect happens at a point called the crossover frequency and it occurs approximately at an altissimo A. At this point, the low frequencies get filtered out by the open tone holes, but the high frequencies don't. At the same time, the resonances within the instrument bore get more erratic and weak on the very high notes. And the resonances in the vocal tract start to become much more important in controlling the reed's vibration. Now, really getting to the heart of the altissimo problem. So let me say this again. As you progress above the palm keys into the altissimo range, the shape of your vocal tract becomes more and more important to what notes come out. You see, changing the shape of your mouth and altering the position of your larynx, etc., generates different resonant frequencies, which in turn change how the reed vibrates. I'll put it bluntly now. If your vocal tract isn't in the right position, you won't get the altissimo notes out. If your vocal tract isn't in the right position, you won't get the altissimo notes out. Don't worry though, you're about to learn how to change this. Just before we move on to see how we can alter our vocal tracks, let me just bust a few common myths. Ever heard this or something like it in regards to saxophone playing? Create a faster airstream by arching your tongue into an E shape. Or maybe you've heard an analogy about water in a hose pipe when you put your thumb on the end. I have. In fact, I bet you'll even find me saying it on YouTube if you look hard enough. These instructions are all well-intentioned and reflect what we think we experience in our mouth. But it turns out that I and everyone else has probably got it wrong. For this information, we're all indebted to the incredible research of Dr. Mark Watkins, Dr. Joe Wolf, and many others who have used real-time X-ray, fluoroscopy, endoscopy, pressure pads, and anemometers to get some hard facts about what happens inside the vocal tracts of great saxophonists. With the exception of Dr. Watkins' excellent book, From the Inside Out, this information has only been found in scientific journals and the like, and I can tell you from personal experience that most of it is seriously impenetrable. However, the good news is that I've done all the heavy lifting for you. You're welcome. Here's the insights then. Myth one. Tongue position affects airspeed at the reed. For a given force of blowing, changes in your tongue position, etc., do not affect air speed at the entrance of the mouthpiece. When I say air speed, I mean how fast, in meters per second, each particle of air is traveling. This is because there's such a big difference between the cross-sectional area of the mouth and that of the mouth mouthpiece tip opening that any changes in air speed in the mouthpiece become irrelevant at the reed's tip. If you want a faster airstream, you have to blow harder, it's simple as that. By the way, the reed itself does vibrate faster for altissimo notes, but not because of a faster airspeed. What will create a faster airspeed for a given blowing force, however, is having a narrower tip opening on your mouthpiece, or putting more pressure on the reed with your bottom lip, which has the effect of narrowing the tip opening. Myth two, adjusting the tongue to an E shape is like squirting water through the end of a hose pipe with your thumb. The hose pipe analogy is inaccurate because the tip opening at the mouthpiece is the thumb on the end of the hose pipe already, not your tongue. The equivalent analogy would be squirting the hose with your thumb on the end, then standing on the hose further back. In this analogy, your foot would be your tongue. Myth three, 
direct the airstream up or down. The airstream from the vocal tract cannot be divided or directed into the mouthpiece tip opening at different angles as it already fills the whole space. Sorry everyone, that's just not a thing. Myth four, use a faster airstream for high notes. Anemometer readings at the mouthpiece tip show that the air speed at the tip opening is actually slower for altissimo notes than that of low notes. I know this feels wrong, but that's the truth of the matter. Now, let's be clear. These mythical instructions do have an effect, but not because of the reasons we think. Tongue position and vocal tract adjustments change the acoustic impedances within your body, which in turn influences the vibration of the reed. As teachers, we're attempting to communicate how something intuitively feels, which is valuable. But now we know the full picture, I think it's time to update our teaching methods. Anyway, we've now got a good grip on the physics and the main things you need to remember are, number one, the shape of your vocal tract and embouchure matters for playing altissimo notes, a lot. <laughs> number two, fingerings become more blurry in the altissimo range than in the normal range, and we can start to use cross fingerings beyond the crossover frequency of around altissimo A. Number three, the airspeed at the mouthpiece tip is actually slower for altissimo notes, not faster, and different tongue positions don't make a difference to airspeed, although they do have an effect for other reasons. Okay, so it's all about the vocal tract then. Cool, but what is the vocal tract anyway? Let's switch to anatomy mode now. I'm keeping the lab coat on. You need to control the shape of your vocal tract to get high notes. So to cut through the confusion, let's start with the hard facts about what the vocal tract is and what anatomical parts it contains. Once you know that, then we can drill down into exactly what each component part can do and how to master these movements to play altissimo. This is a cross section of the head, as if someone has been vertically sawn in half through the middle of their nose. As you can see, the nasal cavity is connected to the vocal tract at the back, which is why you can both breathe through your nose and spew up drink through your nose when you laugh unexpectedly. <laughs> We don't need to be concerned with the nasal cavity in terms of saxophone playing as the flap of skin at the back of our mouths, called the vellum, closes it off while we're playing notes so that the air from our lungs doesn't flow out of our nose. There are two tubes that travel up inside your neck. One is the esophagus, that carries food down to your digestive system, and the other is your trachea, which travels to your lungs. A little flap called the epiglottis stops food going into your lungs when you swallow. The larynx is located near the top of the trachea. The larynx is a flexible complex of cartilage and bone that can expand up and down, tip forwards and move out and back. The front part of the larynx, the thyroid cartilage, is what's referred to as the Adam's apple. Women also have an Adam's apple, but it doesn't stick out as they have a smaller larynx. Importantly, as your larynx moves up and down, it changes the effective length of the vocal tract, changing the resonant frequencies within. The vocal folds are two fleshy flaps that can vibrate together, allowing you to speak or sing, and they sit horizontally within the larynx complex. Technically, the glottis is the area between the vocal folds, so when the vocal folds shut together, we can say the glottis is closed and vice versa. Between the larynx and the mouth is the pharynx. It sounds like an evil character from a Marvel comic, but it's just the tube behind your mouth and tongue. You might informally call it the back of your throat. Apart from a channel for food and air, the pharynx can be seen as a resonating chamber and changes to its shape impact our sac sound. Moving further up, we get into the mouth cavity itself, another variable resonating chamber for our sound. If you put your tongue behind your top teeth and trace it back, the first thing you feel is a hard ridge just behind your teeth. The fancy name for this is the alveolar ridge. Then you'll feel the hard roof of your mouth called the hard palate, which becomes soft and smooth towards the back. That's your soft palate or your velum. The hard palate can't be manipulated, but the soft palate can. With experienced players, the soft palate rises towards the brain in a dome-like shape for the palm keys and altissimo notes. This movement is a significant technique, making palm key notes and the altissimo range much easier for you. The mouth cavity space is dominated by the tongue. The tongue is pretty big, actually, extending almost the whole length of the vocal tract from the pharynx to the teeth and even beyond if you stick it out. 
Instead of the fancy anatomical names for the regions of the tongue, for our purposes, we can divide the tongue into the tip, the front, the middle, and the back. These are the areas that we need to be able to manipulate whilst playing saxophone. As we've already discovered, altering the tongue's shape doesn't affect airspeed at the reed, but it does change the resonant characteristics of the vocal tract, and that's even more important for us. Last but not least, we've got the lips and teeth, which are the main components of your embouchure. Now that you're familiar with the vocal tract and the physics of the saxophone, I'll get this lab coat off and we can isolate some of the most important techniques for your altissimo playing. Okay, this is where the rubber hits the road, guys. Let's start with your tongue. With all these techniques, there's many different ways to skin a cat. And if something works for you that's different from what I say, that's all cool. If it works, it works. Generally speaking though, Altissimo note production requires you to keep your tongue very close to the reed without arching the front and middle. And your tongue will even feel like it's going down underneath the reed. So think down and forward with no arch. Your soft palate needs to be raised up. If you run your tongue along the roof of your mouth, you'll feel where it gets shiny and soft. That's your soft palate. If you shine your phone torch into your mouth and say, hung ah, you'll see your soft palate and tongue touch for the hung and separate for the ah. Imagine there's a string attached to the back of your soft palate and there's a tiny person back there pulling the string, making your soft palate dome inwards. You should be able to control this with practice. The glottis is the technical name for the area between your vocal folds. Remember, your vocal folds are inside your larynx here. It's very important to keep your glottis almost closed to create a strong standing wave in your vocal tract. Let me explain. Imagine you're in a very small closed room without carpet or furnishings. If you used your voice to sweep a loud from low to high, there'll be one specific pitch that suddenly booms more than all the others, a bit like feedback howling on a PA system. This is the main resonant frequency of the room. And the synchronized acoustic waves at that frequency are multiplying each other, disproportionately amplifying that frequency and creating a strong standing wave. If you move to a different note, the boom will disappear. This is a very annoying and undesirable effect in a room, but exactly what we want in our vocal tract when it comes to altissimo playing. We want that strong standing wave. If we now removed one whole wall of that room, leaving it open to the outside world, and played the same note again, the resonating boomy effect would be either greatly diminished or gone altogether. This is because the acoustic energy that was previously being reflected and multiplying itself is now being dissipated into the outside world and the standing wave would become very weak. In much the same way, if your vocal folds are apart, the acoustic sound waves from the reed dissipate straight down into your lungs through the open door of your glottis and we have a weak standing wave in our vocal tract. Conversely, if you use your vocal folds to almost close your glottis, the acoustic sound waves from the reed will bounce off the closed door and generate a strong standing wave in your vocal tract. To pitch bend notes, play overtones, play altissimo notes and achieve other effects on saxophone, we have to create an almost closed glottis so that the acoustic waves bounce off the vocal folds, creating a strong resonant peak. We need that powerful standing wave in our vocal tract to drive the reed's vibration. As previously mentioned, the glottis shouldn't be completely closed though, as no air would flow from the lungs into your mouth. To practice closing your glottis, make a whispered death rattle sound like this. This is your vocal folds closing the glottis and you should keep your glottis in approximately this position to play the altissimo notes. The larynx itself is often in a slightly lower position for altissimo, more so for tenor and barry than alto. The final part of the equation is your embouchure. As a general rule, you'll need to take more mouthpiece into your mouth. But as you do this, your lip rolls over the reed from its normal position, leaving less lip surface to dampen the reed and a longer area of reed exposed inside your mouth. Although it shouldn't be too noticeable in your first altissimo notes, as you get really high, you'll probably need to apply more pressure on the reed as well. The better you are, the less you'll need to do that. And anecdotally, I hear of players who can go super high without any pressure on the reed, but I can't play super screamers without some extra upwards pressure from the bottom lip. 
To get your altissimo notes out, try to work on these vocal tract shapes. Number one, keep your tongue down and forwards with no arch. Number two, raise your soft palate. Number three, almost close your glottis. Number four, take in more mouthpiece with your embouchure, letting the bottom lip roll in as you do this. Use a bit more bottom lip pressure. If your reed is too soft or your mouthpiece tip opening is too small, you might struggle with the altissimo. I'm not saying to get a number four reed and a 10 star auto link, but you might find it more difficult to get upstairs with a two reed and a Yamaha 4C mouthpiece. Not impossible, just more difficult. The reigning king of Altissimo on YouTube, Sir Valor Sax, only uses something like a six link and two and a half reeds, which goes to show it can be done on a moderate setup. But hey, we don't all have a lifetime to invest in this stuff, so you might wanna consider giving yourself a bit of advantage with your setup, especially to begin with. I'm playing on a Jody Jazz 8M on alto with a three or 3.5 strength Java red box read. Let's start putting all this stuff together then. Drill number one, high mouthpiece notes. Play the highest note you can only using your mouthpiece. The vocal tract shape for the highest note in your mouthpiece is similar to that of the altissimo, so start there. Drill two, overtones. Go to the card linked above for my video and overtones, but we are going to focus on the upper overtones for altissimo work. If you can't play these high overtones, you probably ain't gonna be able to play the altissimo, even though they're not exactly the same technique. Everyone talks about this book, Top Tones for Saxophone by Sigurd Rascher, and I studied the whole book myself back in the day. But to be honest, I think it's really heavy going, and it doesn't actually offer anything in terms of technique advice. However, it is kind of the masterwork on overtone exercises and man, Rasher can really play. What we're going to work on for this overtones drill is playing an ascending seventh arpeggio starting on the second octave B flat, but only using a low B flat fingering. So that's overtones on the notes of B flat, D, F, A flat and top B flat. Use all the tips you've learned so far and have a go. Remember this is an advanced exercise. So if you can't do it, don't stress out too much. Once you've done the B flat seven arpeggio, try B7 and C7 as well. Drill three, overblowing sixths. You start on a second octave C sharp and try and overblow it to get the A sharp above. Again, this can be really tricky, so don't expect instant success. <laughs> Once you've done C sharp, try palm key D and E flat as well. Drill four is the same as drill three, except now you overblow a sixth and a ninth. So you're going to go from C sharp to A sharp and then the D sharp above that. That's an octave above palm key D sharp. Again, try it on palm key D and E flat as well. I'm demonstrating this on alto, which I find much more difficult than tenor, but my tenor is in for a repair. So I've just got a man up here. <laughs> if I can't do it perfectly, it just goes to show what a challenging exercise it is. <laughs> If you go and get the PDF from the description, there's full altissimo fingerings listed right up to the F above palm key F. 
The whole fingerings thing can be very individual though. I use different fingerings to many people. So what I'd advise you to do is go online or go on YouTube and get a bunch of different options for each note and find out which one works for you for each note. I don't have a high F sharp key on my Mark VI, so that makes it different as well. It's also useful to start getting used to using your front F key instead of palm keys for E, F and F sharp, as it's awkward to transition from all the palm keys into other altissimo fingerings. I'm sure you've seen other videos about that. Once you've settled on a basic set of fingerings that work for you, simply do all your usual exercises and patterns, but slowly start extending them up to include the altissimo. For a start, just extend all your scales up to the altissimo. It'll be hard at first, but soon it'll get easier. So that's it for this week. It's been a really epic investigation into the Altissimo range. I know it's a massive video, but I want the best for you guys, and I really want you to understand the whole picture. If you want to learn more sax stuff, go to www.getyoursaxtogether.com forward slash masterclass and get your free one hour lesson with me. And as always, you can support me by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, click the bell icon to be notified when I upload new content, and check out my Insta and Facebook pages. I genuinely appreciate you watching the channel and supporting me, so thank you. Due to popular demand, next Sunday you'll be learning the sax solo for Smooth Operator. But until then, practice smart and have an awesome week. See you later. Or even intermediate and above. It's not looking over there. If you run your come on man